Magnesium is integral for 600 plus biochemical processes in the human body, and yet most people are deficient. Common signs of magnesium deficiency include fatigue, muscle weakness, stunted growth, poor immune function, poor concentration and memory, hormonal imbalances, bone and teeth problems. Most people think grabbing a bottle of whatever cheap stuff on the shelf or at the top of Amazon will solve this. The common misconception is that consuming more magnesium will automatically improve health and well-being. The truth is there are various forms of magnesium, each of which is essential for a variety of physiological processes. Most people are deficient in all forms of magnesium, while even those considered healthy typically only ingest one or two kinds. Consuming all seven of magnesium's primary forms is the key to accessing all of its health benefits. That's why we pack seven forms of 450 milligrams of elemental magnesium into each serving of Wild Mag Complex. One dose a day is all you need. Learn more and grab a bottle today at wildfoods.co. Use code GENIUS for 10% off your order. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Amy Bernard. Uh, she's the head of strategy and programs for the nanoscience and neuroscience divisions of the Kavli Foundation. So we had to talk about uh, decoding the brain and what's called the International Brain Initiative. So welcome, Amy. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me, Rich. It's great to be here. If you would, tell me about uh, the foundation. What's its purpose? And then I want to ask you about uh, your background after that. Sure, absolutely. So uh, the Kavli Foundation is a nonprofit research organization. Uh, we support science philanthropy, and uh, we actually do it ultimately to uh, support advances for the benefit of humanity. Our founder was Fred Cavalli, who is an entrepreneur. He was a champion of supporting basic sciences, and uh, like to remind people that everything we touch in our daily lives has been developed by or improved through basic research and science. And he would actually selected four fields that he was really interested in himself and wanted to support uh, through his own philanthropy, which was in astrophysics, theoretical physics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, which he liked to call the big, the small, and the very complex. And he, he selected these areas because he believed they would provide the greatest opportunity for major scientific breakthroughs in the, the long range. Oh, interesting. Okay. So does the foundation provide scholarships for people researching in these areas, or how does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we actually provide support for fundamental scientific research itself. So basic research at the level of actually uh, getting people in the laboratories and performing the science that will ultimately lead to breakthroughs. Uh, and so that's actually something that we like to, to really point out that people will oftentimes hear about the breakthroughs once it comes through a, as a, a medicine or a particular, you know, explosive finding that you see in the New York Times. But a lot of the, the groundwork that happens for sometimes decades before is that basic research. So, so we help fund researchers at universities to do that work. Yeah, I, I, I would guess uh, a lot of research is funded by NIH and, uh, you know, DARPA, et cetera. So how do you guys fit into the puzzle of, uh, you know, when someone wants to do research and they're seeking funding, uh, when do you come into play versus, let's say, the big guys? 
Yeah. So what we really like is that we have a very kind of um, symbiotic relationship with a lot of those big federal funding agencies. They have, you know, obligations to the taxpayers. Um, they need to take on projects that are for national importance and sometimes a little more averse to risk. So where there's a really great opportunity for science philanthropy is in those really is risky early stage sort of just general ideas that nobody knows whether or not they're going to work, but somebody's got to take a risk. We think of it almost as entrepreneurial scientific thinking where we want to start early and get scientists to try out those crazy ideas. And sometimes the research that's funded by federal agencies can't take those risks. So yeah. that's one of the ways that we sort of work together or complementarily um, to support basic science in the United States. And actually, we also support science at a global level. So we go beyond just federal funding in the United States and support basic science uh, around the world and countries around the world. So do you have uh, specific separate scholarships or funding opportunities for each of the four areas? Or like, what are some examples of some of them? Yeah, so we actually fund uh, whole organizations called Cavalry Institutes. Uh, there are 20 Cavalry Institutes around the world that bring together groups of researchers that are innovators, um, you know, affiliated, of course, with universities and research centers who work together at these Kavli Institutes. And we provide funding to those institutes. We also do provide um, research grants that are in the ways of projects that get proposed by researchers in certain emerging areas that are selected by us. And we have a, a bunch of different creative ways that we work collaboratively, either by talking with other funders or by pulling together researchers at convenings where we can really explore for those most exciting ideas and then provide support for those ideas. Hmm. Okay. Um, when someone's, do they work and research uh, long-term as a career at a Kavli Institute or are they at a university and they find out about the Kavli Institute and they do like, a, like a, I guess, a shared research between the university and the institute? Like, how does it work? Yeah, so the, the way that Kavli Institutes work is it pulls together faculty or researchers who are already at existing universities. So it's sort of uh, pulling them together under under essentially a shared umbrella of excellence. And these would be in our, our four different major fields. So in astrophysics, theoretical physics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, these are focus areas where each Kavli Institute would have that particular research focus. And then um, the faculty or the scientists at a particular organization would be in those those fields. So those are the institutes that we support. Um, and then we actually have a number of different ways that we support other kinds of science. Again, it's all about the impact. There are all these different ways that you can get exciting scientific ideas to happen. And so sometimes that is by funding the researchers directly. And sometimes it's by funding projects that may have, you know, changing researchers over time, different people. So it's really a, a multitude of different models, all just to enable the innovation that we really seek to accomplish. So um, any examples of uh, a project in, one of, in each of the four areas? Sure. So, uh, well, uh, there's so many things we've done. I think one of the things that we're particularly proud of actually relates to uh, our involvement with the U.S. Brain Initiative. So actually, the U.S. Brain Initiative, BRAIN, actually is an acronym that stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. And this was a, uh, actually something that was announced during the Obama administration in 2013. There was a whole partnership of both the federal government as well as a number of different private organizations like us, where we recognize the goal of supporting the development and application of innovative technologies specifically for creating an understanding of the brain. And this was years of meetings that we'd had where diverse organizations were recognizing that not each one could go at it alone, but this was a, a shared goal. And working together as an organization collectively to prioritize and identify the biggest questions and how to tackle them was really ultimately going to be necessary to figure out how how the brain works. So um, we were involved very early on by assembling some key scientists from around the world to identify what those questions were, and then to really get forward on a strategy for finding funds to do that. And to date, there's literally been, you know, billions of dollars com combined between private and public funding that goes to the U.S. Brain Initiative. And in fact, the U.S. Brain Initiative has been so successful in providing a groundwork for researchers to work toward understanding the brain that there are other international initiatives that formed as well. So a number of other different countries formed their own um, sort of focus on neuroscience research. And these countries even came together into what we're calling an international brain initiative, 
which was essentially a forum, almost like a United Nations forum, for identifying what the key questions are in neuroscience and then setting forth uh, approaches that, that we could work collaboratively to tackle those by prioritizing funding in certain key areas. So that was right. something the, the Kavli Foundation was involved in very early on, you know, as a participant and kind of helping helping that to shape. And ultimately, the service is much bigger than, you know, our participation alone. It's it's really uh, setting a groundwork for for a much um, broader objective than just our own. But what are, what are some specifics of maybe some of the research that's going on in you know, regards to the brain? Yeah, well, that's regarding the brain. There are a lot of different questions. Of course, it's a super complex organism. Um, in the sense that uh, the human brain itself is literally, it's billions, over 100 billion neurons with 100 trillion connections. Each one of us has that in our heads. And so it's really a great mystery to figure out how does it work. Magnesium is integral for 600 plus biochemical processes in the human body. And yet most people are deficient. Common signs of magnesium deficiency include fatigue, muscle weakness, stunted growth, poor immune function, poor concentration and memory, hormonal imbalances, bone and teeth problems. Most people think grabbing a bottle of whatever cheap stuff on the shelf or at the top of Amazon will solve this. The common misconception is that consuming more magnesium will automatically improve health and well-being. The truth is there are various forms of magnesium, each of which is essential for a variety of physiological processes. Most people are deficient in all forms of magnesium, while even those considered healthy typically only ingest one or two kinds. Consuming all seven of magnesium's primary forms is the key to accessing all of its health benefits. That's why we pack seven forms of 450 milligrams of elemental magnesium into each serving of Wild Mag Complex. One dose a day is all you need. Learn more and grab a bottle today at wildfoods.co. Use code GENIUS for 10% off your order. In terms of just how does thought happen, how does the brain function as a, a system, and how is it built, and what can go wrong? And one of the major uh, challenges, I think, at the onset of the project that was identified is we literally didn't know how many cells there were in the brain and what all the different types were. So when you think about something like, you know, a kidney, people know roughly how many different types and categories of cells there are in a kidney and what they do, but we really didn't know what the diversity was in the brain. And so there was a, a concerted effort to go about and, and literally do an inventory of brain cells. And multitude of different organizations worked on this together, including an organization I was previously at, which is the Allen Institute. And through a lot of work from many different teams, all working under this umbrella of the Brain Initiative, um, there are now uh, literally inventories of the cell types of the brain that are available that were not there before the start of the Brain Initiative. And so that actually gives us just a starting handle into understanding more about the diversity of the brain and then what those actual parts are. And we're now just starting to figure out how those parts are linked together and ultimately, you know, how those are going to give rise to function. So that that's a, a really big sort of um, accomplishment that is cumulatively the work of many different scientists and also touches on the fact that there's the importance now of technology just as much with the basic biology of neuroscience and the technology that was required to handle not just this kind of data, but the complexity of the data and the analysis of data is something that is also kind of uh, interleaving now with advances in everything from AI and machine learning to our ability to actually computationally, you know, handle and understand the questions that are coming th through. So the way researchers are now looking at this is we have the tools to start answering questions that do relate more specifically to, you know, how do di diseases, for example, like autism or schizophrenia, how does that actually at a cellular level uh, come to be so that they can be better addressed. And the multitude of ways in which researchers are addressing these are, you know, I mean, it's, it's thousands and thousands of different researchers, each with their own unique question, but now starting to work with shared tools in a way that we can make more progress. Okay. So, I mean, what are some of the interesting findings that you've seen so far? You talked about the composition of cells, Did anything interesting come out of that or some of the other ex experimentation that you can comment on? Sure. So some of the really interesting things about the cells have to do with the diversity. I think that it really wasn't appreciated at the outset that there would literally be hundreds of different t categories or types of cells that make up the brain. And that complexity, maybe it shouldn't be surprising because the human brain is so complex, but it's, it's going to make it a little more challenging to understand what all the diversity of those cells are doing. 
And so that is work now just even sort of as a, a new finding. It's the dimensionality of the problem. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the brain itself is more complex than anybody had imagined and people had already known it was pretty complex. So some of the things specifically that are being found are individual neurons that have properties that are unique between humans, for example, and other non-human mammals. There are sort of specialized cells that uh, appear in human brain that others don't have. And that's actually been kind of a big question for a while is, you know, is the human brain just sort of bigger than other animal brains? Or is there something special about it that imparts it from, uh, you know, to have the capabilities that others don't? And so some of those specializations are starting to be seen as we're actually able to catalog all of the different types of cells. Um, but more remains to be seen in that there's still more information to be gathered about the diversity even amongst different humans. So that's one of the insights. Um, then there are other insights that have been accessible now just in terms of the vast network of how cells are actually physically connected within the brain itself. So the brain is sort of compartmentalized into different substructures. And for a while, people thought that the, the connections between those substructures was fairly straightforward and simple. And what we're finding now is that it's actually, the brain is a lot more interconnected than we thought. And this actually even has implications for how we think about things like artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, some of the deep network design. It, it's actually um, complexity of the system with redundancy and with much information is providing much sort of richer information exchange than we might have originally have anticipated. So the networks aren't simple, they're complex. And then that also leads to their flexibility. And these are just, you know, sort of high level insights are coming. What we're really excited about as well, I would say as a field is more and more information about these individual cells is also going to be something that clinically is going to translate into certain types of personalized medicine and advances in personalized medicine. So I would say that is still for the, the future of where the field is going. We know that those cells individually have differences, but we don't yet understand what that sort of person to person variability is. And that's a big focus, I think, for the field in the next, you know, five to 10 years. Has anyone characterized the type of information that is shared amongst different cell types in the brain? Oh, that is a really great question. So the type of information that's that's shared between cells of the brain, basically there's, there's some two main ways that cells communicate. They communicate electrically. Um, so, you know, literally through electrical impulses and the diversity of the kinds of codes that you think of almost like Morse codes that are used by those cells are also now getting uncovered. So there are a number of different researchers that look at what's called the electrophysiology or literally the physiology of how electrical impulses are shared across the brain. And we are finding that just like the cell types themselves, there are certain signatures of those electrical signers, signals that are very unique. Uh, it's almost as though every cell type has its own way of speaking, its own little language and how it talks to other cells. So at the electrical, literally the electrical kind of Morse code that is used is a, a complex language unto itself, and that hadn't previously been appreciated. We previously thought that there were sort of much more simple um, states of either, you know, a cell is firing or it's not firing, or it's firing fast or slow. But the complexity of this kind of intercell cell communication is, a, a, you know, again, sort of theme here is a lot more complex. So, you know, that's exciting because it tells you that there is more nuanced information that can be shared between these cells, but it does mean now we have to uncover what all those different, you know, now that we know the language is complex, we have to understand the words, so to speak, and what the, what that communication mode is. So there's certainly electrical communications that happen, but then there's other types of communications as well that are sometimes even reliant on cells that are not just neurons. So neurons are the kinds of cells that actually generate those electrical impulses. But even cells that aren't neurons have a bigger role in actually fostering communication throughout the brain through just the connectedness of the cells themselves um, and the shape and the morphology of those cells. So there's electrical communication, I guess small molecules maybe are exchanged. Maybe there's uh, extracellular vesicles that they use to communicate as well. Like what, what have you found are the different Absolutely. types of communication so far? So those types of communications in terms of the differential cell types, the electrical modes is just one of them. Um, there are also, uh, so neural chemicals, peptides, um, basically neurotransmitters. So different small molecules that are exchanged between cells uh, or act as sort of instruction sets, instruction packets. And the complexity again of those is commensurate with the different cell types. So the cell types themselves with that kind of complexity, we're seeing that each one has a different sort of 
type of cargo that can communicate and different rules. And so it's not just um, what the cell is sort of dumping next to the cell, you know, adjacent to it in terms of what that molecular cargo is, but it's very relevant as to what other cell types it is talking to. So literally the, the formation of synapses um, at the connection between one neuron and another neuron where they connect, the nature of that connection and the sort of uniqueness of that connection is actually another modulatory component for essentially gating how cells talk to each other throughout the brain. And so, you know, it, it sounds obvious that, um, you know, that there's been sort of an adage for a long time, cells that wire together fire together, <laughs> meaning that the cells that talk to each other or that actually touch are the cells that are also going to communicate electrically. But there are also now we're finding much more uh, or the additional ways in that cells can regulate communication are gated by, you know, proximity as well as the, the character of the cell. So what it's the nature of its connectedness with another, the nature of the synapse, and then even things like, um, you know, gap junctions or the gaps between cells that can allow different types of communication through uh, waveforms. So there are essentially these um, waveforms that can also be generated that allow at a cell uh, at a, a level that's not just cell to cell level, but groups of cells and whole regions of brains that can be entrained together. And this actually even has clinical relevance for some now technologies involved in deep brain stimulation uh, and really exploring the ways in which electrical signals, not just at an individual cellular level, but at a group level can communicate. Um, has anyone found within uh, you know, a group of neurons that are firing together, uh, are there ones that start the firing cascade or are they so synchronized that they appear to fire simultaneously? Is there a hierarchy even within a particular cell type? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's absolutely... Um, I, I'm not quite sure if we know enough about the hierarchy other than the regulatory sort of rule sets for who fires when. Um, absolutely, those kinds of networks and the network dynamics are what are, uh, I would say, becoming slave to the cell types themselves. So what the cell types are will dictate how and when they receive information from other cells and hence then when they fire and under what conditions they fire. And almost what I think is particularly important for thinking about health and um, brain function is um, the plasticity or the flexibility under which those can be changed and modulated. So the ways in which certain individual cells sort of have rules and then the extent of plasticity of rules is absolutely providing, um, let's say, a, it, it's sort of like the, uh, the instruction manual for, for how the brain's going to work. And what we're finding is that and this is coming back to my, my point about the fact that there's extraordinary cellular diversity with hundreds of different types, that the combinatorics around understanding those rules across all the sheer number of cells in the brain is just a, a massive computational challenge. So breaking down the sort of computational challenges of what is the hierarchy between which cells have which rule sets is something now that really uh, is becoming a big data problem. So it's becoming a something for which a simple experiment can't on its own just solve that question, but the data mining and data modeling that's required for this, and then use of actual measured information to feed those models is where now we have a technology um, through machine learning that can actually help us address those questions. So, you know, it, we don't yet have sort of the, the structure of what cells are doing exactly what we're still in this data gathering phase. But I would say that the data gathering phase is going to allow a bigger analytical model to answer exactly those questions that you ask. Hey, you know, the old expression, you know, I'm in two minds about it. Um, does the evidence show that the brain acts monolithically or can different parts of the brain act very independently? And then do they compare stimuli and then decide a response or, you know, what does it look like? Is it, uh, again, is the brain a group of factions that are coordinated by a master or is it, um, this is again one thing that acts together. Yeah, the, these are. This is an amazing question. It's actually the source of a lot of, I would say, lively debate in the field of, um, you know, to what extent does it act together versus to what extent are there sort of controlling regions? And I think that the the simplest question, or the simplest answer, is that there are absolutely um, there are absolutely subsections of the brain that both have some autonomous function. Uh, for example, the cerebellum is a fairly autonomous structure in terms of its uh, its role and its capabilities, but they are all interconnected. And there has been a lot of question in the field about to what extent there are sort of master controller areas of the brain 
um, and to what extent that there is uh, changeability or adaptability across those functions. So if you think, for example, um, there's a structure called the claustrum in the brain, which is a very sort of small focused structure that is extraordinarily highly connected with other uh, anatomical structures in the brain. And it is perceived that this structure then may have some sort of a regulatory or central regulator function, but it's been very difficult to prove that experimentally for a variety of reasons where, um, you know, to have a, to have a living system, we are essentially parsing that living system for dependency on a, a master structure. is just, it's a challenge. And so, uh, researchers have been creating, um, pretty creative systems for, for, uh, uncoupling subfunctions of that structure with dependency and readout for implications on the whole brain. And even when you think about something as fundamental as consciousness, you know, how is the brain conscious? What does that mean? And how is that regulated? It actually comes back to questions of sort of what, what is the controlling mechanism for the brain itself? And, and it actually turns not just into a practical scientific question, but almost a philosophical question. You can, you know, you can ask about central brain function for somebody say, who is cognitively or what they might refer to as clinically brain dead, where their bodily functions are functioning, they're breathing, maybe their heart's beating, but they may not actually have any brain waves left that are, that are indicating cognitive thought and thought processes. So that's obviously decoupling two functioning systems in the brain where you have a body support system, but then you also have the ability to think, um, to formulate ideas, to have concepts, to have a sense of consciousness. And so we know those things can be decoupled, but the extent to which there is uh, sort of unifying alignment between them is actually, it's a much bigger question. And, and that's where, you know, understanding more of these sort of circuit dependencies and what each of the different cells capabilities are, uh, you know, I think we'll get there, but we're not there yet. Okay. Well, very good. Um, what's the best place to go to, to see an overview of the research and if someone's listening that is at an institution or at a university of uh, you know, how can they find out about what grants are available, what activities, and see if the, you know that lines up with what they do? Where can people go? Yeah, that's a, a great question. How do people get funding? So um, there are a number of different places. I mean, certainly for, I would say, things related to the U.S. Brain Initiative, there's a, a Brain Initiative Alliance website. Uh, I don't know if we can post it somewhere, but the Brain Initiative Alliance actually is a number of different federal and non-federal partners, all of whom support Brain Initiative-related funding. And each one has their own slightly different way that they fund. So it's it's worthwhile to sort of see that in aggregate. The U.S. federal government provides a really comprehensive database of what U.S. federal grants are available. Um, and that's something for which researchers are very familiar. There's then other ways in which um, particularly organizations that have a, a research focus in a certain area of disease, for example, have their own ways. For the Kavli Foundation, we actually have a, a novel approach that we use um, where we're more inspired by the questions themselves and use those questions to identify on our own where can we deploy funds that are going to be going toward um, really exploring a new question. So we don't have the same kind of request for proposals that, for example, a big federal organization like the National Institutes of Health might have. But those uh, sort of funding aggregators particularly supported by NIH, are really good places to look. Okay, very good. Um, any other resources for listeners, or is that plenty? I think that, you know, resources for listeners are that there's so many different ways of actually getting involved in neuroscience, either just because you're curious about the questions or because there's the opportunity to enroll in a research study or to volunteer, um, to participate. And, you know, I think of neuroscience in particular is, a, is something that touches everybody in some way, way, shape, or form. And for people to feel that this is a, a sort of participatory field for them, um, rather than something that's just being done by scientists in their labs, is really actually going to be necessary for the field to move forward and is a lot of fun because there's a lot to learn. Well, very good. Amy, thank you so much for coming on and explaining about the, the, the Catholic Foundation and uh, all, the, all the work that you guys are doing on the brain. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the time that you had to talk with me. Magnesium is integral for 600 plus biochemical processes in the human body. And yet most people are deficient. Common signs of magnesium deficiency include fatigue, muscle weakness, stunted growth, poor immune function, poor concentration in memory, hormonal imbalances, bone and teeth problems. 
Most people think grabbing a bottle of whatever cheap stuff on the shelf or at the top of Amazon will solve this. The common misconception is that consuming more magnesium will automatically improve health and well-being. The truth is there are various forms of magnesium, each of which is essential for a variety of physiological processes. Most people are deficient in all forms of magnesium, while even those considered healthy typically only ingest one or two kinds. Consuming all seven of magnesium's primary forms is the key to accessing all of its health benefits. That's why we pack seven forms of 450 milligrams of elemental magnesium into each serving of Wild Mag Complex. One dose a day is all you need. Learn more and grab a bottle today at wildfoods.co. Use code GENIUS for 10% off your order. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.